Thank you. Ethel May, that was such a nice introduction. There is no upside in my saying anything because it will just diminish uh, the flavor it was just said. Uh, she said some very nice things about me, and some of them were even true. Um, and I, I asked her, I said, you tell me something about uh, the people of Joplin. She said, well, you know, every one of them needs a new roof. <laughs> <laughs> Milton Friedman says there's no such thing as a free lunch, but for all of you, that's not true today. Uh, and thank you all for coming, and especially thank uh, you, Ethel May, uh, for hosting this and to all of your associates at uh, uh, TAMCO. Uh, the Show Me Institute uh, is a public policy research think tank. Uh, my youngest son the other day said, do you guys just sit around and think all day? Um, and someone else said, how big is that tank? Um, <laughs> so, you know, we're scoring a lot of points right off the bat. Uh, but our job is to foster research into what are the best public policies for the state of Missouri and the cities therein. And generally what we are doing and will do is to find the best economist and public policy analyst to do the research uh, that we need. Then we have to take that research, translate it, make it user friendly, and get it out to the public, the cognoscenti, and most of all, we have to lean on our dearly beloved public policy makers. You notice how I said that because there are some of them in the room. Um, and uh, our goals are to have a, a major impact, to get a much better tax structure in the state of Missouri. Uh, my own goal, I think it is shared, but I, I can't say for sure yet, my own goal is to see that the personal income tax in Missouri is eliminated. Um, uh, economists uh, of almost all persuasions uh, will agree that income taxes and taxes on capital or profits are the most distortionary of taxes. They do the greatest harm and by taxing people's income, you are taxing the most mobile resource. And people will move to avoid income taxes. We only have to look at places like Nevada, who every day, every Nevadian should get up and thank California, uh, because California is loaded with idiotic policies. Uh, and they are going to get a lot worse. Uh, their top income tax bracket right now is 10 and a half, and it's going to go to 12.2. Uh, with the new initiative that's being started by, you all remember the meathead, Rob Reiner? Well, that's what's going on there. So it's things like that that we want to avoid. Uh, other really bad taxes in this state are the earnings taxes of St. Louis and Kansas City. Uh, they have done tremendous damage uh, to not just those cities, but to the state. Uh, Metro East, the part of St. Louis on the other side of the river, owes its existence and its growth to the bad tax policies of St. Louis. Uh, and the state of Missouri. And the other big area, of course, is education. We want to see that there is some real form of school choice and competition, especially in the inner cities of St. Louis and Kansas City. And uh, finally, I must say it is really a delight uh, to be back in Missouri, and it's a delight not to be out on the left coast. Um, you know, that place is, I hope I don't offend anybody here. I've never done that before in my life. Um, there's, you know, there, you're just surrounded by, by liberals out there, and of course, you, you can always tell a liberal. You just can't tell them very much. <laughs> Ethel May, thank you very much. I really am thrilled to be here, in part because I've long referred to Ethel May as my Missouri mom, and it's always great to get back and, and see her, and also because uh, I'm going to be able, I hope, in this hour and maybe in some of the other presentations I've made, uh, to be of help to uh, one of the newest and most dynamic and promising free market think tanks in the country, the Show Me Institute. I have visited uh, think tanks by the dozens around the country and around the world, and many of them have sent uh, delegations to our headquarters to learn how we do what we do. And I can say, from what I understand of uh, the early days here of the Show Me Institute, that you folks are poised to make history. And if I can be of any way, in any way helpful in that regard, I'll uh, wear it as a, as a great badge of honor. So I'm delighted to be here. If you're already supporters of the Show Me Institute, I thank you. And if you're considering becoming a supporter, let me say thank you for that as well. You'll not be disappointed. I have a story I'd like to uh, open with, and it happens to be a true story. It comes from a testimony before a congressional committee some years ago from a developer in Louisiana. And uh, as this story goes, the developer 
was planning a new construction project. At one point, he learned that he had to secure the approval first of no fewer than 23 local, parish, and state agencies before he could begin. And just when he thought everything was done and ready to go, he learned that he had to apply for approval from the Department of Housing and Urban Development in Washington. So he and his attorney filled out all the required forms, sent them off to HUD, whereupon the agency sent back the following reply. We received today your letter enclosing application for your client in support of abstract of title. We have observed, however, that you have not traced the title to the property previous to 1803. Before final approval can be granted, you must trace the title previous to that year. And you can imagine uh, the developer and his attorney were outraged at this example of bureaucratic foot dragging, and they fired off to HUD the following reply, which has in the years since become somewhat of a classic. Dear gentlemen, your letter regarding title has been received. I noted that you wished title to be traced further back than I have done. Well, I was unaware that any educated man failed to know that Louisiana was purchased from France in 1803. <laughs> but he doesn't end there. He goes on to say, the title to that land was acquired by France by right of conquest from Spain. The land came into the possession of Spain by right of discovery in 1492 <laughs> by an Italian sailor named Christopher Columbus. <laughs> The good Queen Isabella had taken the precaution of securing the blessing of the Pope of Rome upon Columbus's voyage before she sold her jewels to help him. The Pope, in turn, is the emissary of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. <laughs> God made the world. I think it's safe to assume that God created that part of the world known as the U.S. and that part of the U.S. known as Louisiana, and I hope the hell you're satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the spirit there summarizes uh, maybe much of my message today. I want to talk to you about seven principles of sound public policy. And I always like to begin this by telling people that none of these seven principles are original with me. They will sound very familiar to you. Uh, you may have heard uh, far more notable people than me uh, put, them, put them to use in speeches like uh, Ronald Reagan or Milton Friedman. I've simply collected seven of them, put them in this one talk, and added some of my own examples, and I like to present them as simple but enormously profound. These principles are so important, I think, that uh, if every state legislature and at the federal capitol in Washington, if every capitol building in every state and in Washington had them emblazoned in, in the cornerstones of their buildings, and more importantly, if legislators every day passed them, read them, understood them, and made law accordingly, uh, we'd be a lot better off. We'd have a lot less mischief in uh, places like Jefferson City or Lansing, Michigan, or Washington, D.C., and we'd be freer and more prosperous as a result. And even though these principles are uh, simple yet profound, uh, it really is important for us to step back from time to time from the busy work of dealing with uh, policy issues and look at the bigger picture, and that's what these principles are all about. Sometimes we are misled into thinking that policy is simply too complicated for principles, but I don't believe that's the case. Uh, we should not be like that character in uh, that Groucho Marx played in one of his movies where he said, those are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. <laughs> I think we, sh we should have principles and we should stick to them. The first principle of sound public policy is free people are not equal, and equal people are not free. Free people are not equal, and equal people are not free. Now, what do I mean by that? I have to tell you that uh, it's the, the kind of equality that I'm referring to is not equality before the law, a very important political principle and pillar of Western civilization, something that I think all of us would readily agree with, even though we'd recognize we sometimes fall short of it. What I'm talking about more narrowly is economic equality in material wealth and income. When people are free, they're not going to be equal economically. And you hear lamentations about that all the time from people who decry the gap between the rich and the poor, 
and who want to use government to try to uh, level people. But I'm saying that if people are free, they're going to generate differences in incomes and differences in material wealth. And as long as those differences are reflections of their personal traits and abilities and ambitions, <coughs> then that's great news, not something to lament. In fact, uh, we could spend all day just talking about the reasons which explain why people are different and why those differences account for differences in income. I'll just give you three quick ones. One is talent. We're different in terms of the talents that we have. And some people uh, don't discover what their highest talent is, maybe until late in life. Best example I can think of that is from my home state of Michigan. Uh, you've all eaten products made by the Kellogg Company, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I don't know if you know much about the origin of that company, but there were two brothers, Will and John Harvey Kellogg, in Ballow Creek, Michigan, way back in the uh, latter part of the 19th century. And as the neighbors looked upon that family, they all thought, John Harvey is going places because he's smart, but Will Kellogg probably isn't going to amount to much because he's slow and doesn't seem to be too ambitious and probably destined to be his older brother's understudy. Uh, for the rest of his life. And he failed at an early age, W.K. did, Will, at uh, a number of ventures. He tried being a broom salesman door to door for a time, but he didn't have the personality to uh, push brooms. Uh, people would answer the door and he would say, uh, you don't happen to want to buy a broom, do you? <laughs> and uh, he, so that didn't last very long. And he ended up working for John Harvey at uh, his older brother's famous sanitarium in Battle Creek. And John Harvey was a believer in all sorts of uh, health fads and, and uh, gimmicks, and some were, had merit, some I think probably did not. But nonetheless, he was world famous. And in all the years that Will worked for his older brother, he never made more than $25 a week. And one of his uh, assignments was to prepare the breakfast food for the patients at the hospital every morning according to a formula that his older brother had put together. And that involved mixing up this uh, stuff that was kind of like a moist gruel. And then the night before, he would uh, cover it. And he went in early the next morning and uncovered it, rolled it out with a rolling pin and cut it into squares and served it in bowls. One night, he forgot to cover it. And the next morning, he went in, roll, ran the rolling pin over it, and it all flaked up. It was dried. And uh, he didn't know what to do at that point. That was all they had. So he served it in bowls as dried flakes. And the patients loved it. And uh, Will went to his older brother after a couple of days of this and said, this is the way the patients want the breakfast cereal. They don't want uh, the, the stuff we'd been serving. And this is so popular, he said, I think we ought to go in business and sell this to other people outside the hospital. And his older brother dismissed it and said, that's crass commercialism. I'll never permit that. And Will kept pressing him for weeks and weeks and weeks never could get him to relent until finally, at the age of 46, never having made more than $25 a week, Will Kellogg ventures, ventures out on his own, test markets several different kinds of flakes and settles on corn, and starts the Kellogg company making corn flakes. And uh, it's a success, a modest one at first, and people told him, if you really want to take this national and make a lot of money, you need to break into the New York City market. And so Will, had to come up with some kind of a gimmick to get this stuff to sell in New York City. And so he dreams up this legendary marketing campaign around the slogan, Wednesday is Wink Day in New York. That was the official slogan. He went to grocers in uh, uh, New York City and he said, here are the rules, post them in the window. If a housewife comes into your store on a Wednesday and winks at you, she gets a free box of Kellogg Corn Flakes. And he had detailed rules about how to handle them if they come in on a Tuesday and start winking at you. <laughs> and keep in mind, this is, uh, this is risque for, this, these are Victorian times. This is 1905 America. Well, it was such a hit that in no time at all, he was sending train loads of Kellogg's cornflakes to New York City, went on from there to conquer the breakfast habits of America and much of the world. And within 20 years from the day he left his uh, brother's employment, Will Kellogg, became one of America's 20 wealthiest citizens. 